Hello, everybody. I'm Lucas Kendall. This is my friend and co-host, Charlie Vignola, and we are here with our special guest manager and producer, Peter Katz of Story Driven. Peter, thank you so much for being with us. And we're so excited to, um, to talk to you about representation, about writing, about filmmaking, about directing. Sometimes it's fun just to go into something cold, uh, just so we start talking. And Charlie wanted to talk about Batgirl because that's all anybody's talking about today. <laughs> well, I wanted to talk a little bit about Batgirl only because there is a Bruckheimer connection. I worked for Bruckheimer for over 30 years. So uh, the writer of uh, the Batgirl movie was uh, Christina Hodgson, who uh, was one of the writers working on the Pirates of the Caribbean 6 uh, script. So uh, we have a connection there. And uh, the directors, Adil and Bilal, were the directors who did uh, Bad Boys for Life for us which was uh, the biggest grossing movie of 2020. Now there's an asterisk on that year, that's the COVID year, but it still did very well. And um, just as somebody who, who knows the deal in Bilal and work with them on Bad Boys, they're such great guys. They're young, they're dynamic, they're energetic, they're very creative. They, they did a great job on Bad Boys. They were really looking forward to uh, Batgirl and to just read that news uh, yesterday must have been such a, body blow because to work on something for you know a year and a half and, and put your heart and soul into it only to find out like it's not getting released at all anywhere you know uh is, is just got to be wrenching gut wrenching to you um you know i'm i'm sure they're already on to their their next gig but uh you know this this they put a lot of hard work into this and um i can't think of another movie this big that's not getting released since i guess what the lord miller version of solo that got uh, put aside uh, and reshot by by Ron Howard. So um, I guess this will go down as one of those sort of great mystery movies like The Day the Clown Cried or, you know, the Eric Stoltz uh, act one of Back, Back to the Future. Um, I, I understand from the little I've read that it's part of a tax strategy on Warner Brothers part, you know, because now that David Zaslav has gone over there and um, is really kind of cleaning house, shutting down movies, I know he killed the Wonder Twins movie that was about to start over there. Uh, and Warner Brothers already has issues with uh, their big Flash movie because of all of the uh, legal issues uh, involving Ezra Miller, the star, and his erratic behavior. He's, he's been like Randy Quaid in, in his behavior. So that was trouble on top of trouble. And now the Batgirl movie has been derailed. So, you know, I, Warner Brothers already had a lot of issues where they're sort of expanded DC universe. This just seems to be compounding the issue, and you know, once again, it's they can't see. Peter's wondering when he can talk, Charlie. Yeah, thank you, by the way, Lucas, for that incredibly yeah. rude segue. Uh, Peter, what do you what do you think of all this? Well, first off, thanks for having me on your show. I uh, I appreciate it. It's always fun to talk, you know, talk business. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's kind of depressing. Like, I don't know the the accounting that goes behind why anybody would shelve a film, but it's, it's, I feel bad for the fans. I mean, like they're going to suffer from this and it's one of those things that you almost expect. It's like Hanukkah or Christmas. It's going to come on time. You're going to get the gifts. Like you, like there's a, there's a ritual to these type of movies. Like you, you have like, you look out in the distance and you know that in maybe eight months you're going to see this film. So it just kind of, it's almost like a glitch in the matrix for all these, uh, you know, DC fans. I didn't even know they were making a Batgirl movie. Um, yeah, the, the problem with keeping track of DC properties is there's no uniformity to any of it. There's a Flash TV series. There's also a Flash movie not connected to the Black TV series. There's a Joker movie that's not connected to the Batman movie. I mean, everything is all over the place over there and um you know they don't, they don't have a kevin feige master and commander of all of the you know dc comics character franchises unlike marvel so i'm not really sure everything is kind of a grab bag over there uh, the the um the accounting thing quickly i read that it had to do with the acquisition by discovery of warner brothers that anything that they saw now is they could just write off as part of the acquisition so they wouldn't have to deal with it later. But I'm mildly self-conscious to be like industry people critiquing something in the industry because 
it's not like we're just at a bar and we can say whatever. We're recording this to be put on YouTube. So I think we're all wanting to be candid, but also a little uh, conscious. I am at least of like, who could I be criticizing or what could go out there and be taken the wrong way? And Charlie, I am sorry to be rude. That was rude. No, it's, it's this is part of the banter. This is part of the fun. <laughs> um, no, I was going to say that Warner Brothers has some of the greatest franchises in cinema, which makes it even more difficult, I think, for fans like all of us who, who want to see these movies, that when this kind of stuff is going on, uh, especially during this um, major um, uh, up upheaval that's going on with Discovery, uh, it just sort of throws everything off and also uh, as a place for filmmakers to go you know there was a lot of controversy when during covid uh you know warner decided to release theatrical films straight to hbo max for a full year that really bothered nolan that really bothered a lot of big filmmakers and they had to do a lot of work to kind of win them back over and no sooner do they do that than you find out oh now that david zaslav has taken over they're killing a major, you know, DC movie that will never see the light of day. And obviously, you know, what does that convey? What does that transmit to filmmakers? Like, you know, all bets are off. We just don't know what's going to happen over there. So I just think that's another issue they're now going to have to deal with over at Warner. Yeah, I mean, I think that's terrible that, you know, the fans can't get their movie. That's just, you know, it's like you have an expectation. You're like, that's what I'm going to watch. And then it doesn't happen. I mean, who knows? Maybe it leaks one day and everybody gets to watch it. It uh, just magically leaks. I don't know. Well, but you never know. I mean, I got to say that I like the, the streamer. I got a lot of value from um, the, you know, what they provide on that platform. There's so much great content. I like Hacks. I think that's an mm -hmm. H, uh, HBO Max show. That's really good. There's so many good offerings. So it's like I can't wait for Succession to return. So it's almost one end. You're like, oh man, I don't, I, I don't like all this. You know, this is gonna suck. The other end, I'm like, I'm just looking at the calendar. I'm like, I want to see Succession. I can't wait. So like, I feel that like there's this kind of ebbs and fl you know flows of like the of this giant media conglomerate. You know, and I think it's as victim of the technology. It's like an earthquake, just ripple effects, and then we're all feeling them in different ways. Uh, and in some ways you know, the streamer is, has to consolidate to survive. And you see like a lot of the business beyond the streamers contracting uh, in, you know, either in an interesting way to contracting where you mean different types of entertainment, like video games and movies and TV shows, like this idea that like you have this cross medium entertainment company or it's just the same category. It's just combining. So I think we're feeling those vibrations and, you know, sometimes there's benefits of that. And then sometimes the negative consequences are the fans of this DC movie are just not going to be able to enjoy, you know, this, th this movie that would have been probably released in a traditional manner in theaters, given its budget and, you know, its brand, uh, if this didn't happen in the multiverse that this, all this didn't happen, it probably would have, you know, got released. So yeah, I think it's, there's there's pros and cons, but I still have enjoyed their streamer. So I can't talk too negatively about it because I'm like, yeah, I do. You know, I, I like what I get from them. You know, it's a, it's a pretty solid offering. I love their platform. I watch it all the time. Yeah, they, they have one of the one of the best platforms. But it actually, you know, it brings up a great question to kick off with you, Peter, which is given the massive upheaval that's going on in the entertainment business right now, and it looks to be going on for a while longer before things sort of settle out like does that make your job more difficult in terms of how you're figuring out who needs what where and the shifting priorities and you know the people who are in one place one day who are no longer there that you now have to remake your connections with elsewhere like how do you how are you navigating all this on a day-to-day -day basis well i just focus on what i love and you know i have a lot of people on a regular basis who are like hey check out my movie as a directing sample or check out my script, you know, you know, looking for representation. And I only connect with what makes sense to me. It's not like I have an objective view where if I don't like something, it's doomed. Or if I like something, it guarantees it to be the most popular series ever. It's just my own taste. And that's what I'm, I, you know, as I navigate this world is that it's what I believe in and I fight for my tastes. And if it means that a story ends up as a TV show or if it ends up as an audio drama podcast, then 
to then be sold as a TV show, it doesn't matter as long as I really care about it, you know? So there could be all sorts of like executive shuffling, but I know what I'm selling. You know, if I'm going to one person I know, great. If it's a new person, I make an intro, I build a new relationship, but I don't think my core has shifted at all. Um, I think I'm more innovative now than I've been before and how I look at IP, how I look at taking out all sorts of different types of work, like short stories. To me, that's very exciting. I'm signing a lot of like authors uh, from all different areas of uh, the publishing world, but specifically ones that really focus on high concept short stories to take out as pitches. So for me, I'm excited about the opportunities that are out there. But yeah, I know that there's going to be a lot of things shifting as I'm going about my business. But if I get so caught up on the disruption, I forget that like I have taste and I have to fight for that vision of what I want to see on screen. But ultimately, I'm a fan first. I have to be like, I want to see this movie or I want to see this TV show and I'll do whatever it takes to get there. And if it means, oh no, one streamer is not open for business, you go to the other streamer. It's whatever's out there to me. And I think there's always going to be challenges but there's always going to be a demand for, you know, great material, especially where I come from. I focus a lot of on genre and there's always a demand for really good genre stories and the storytellers that create them. And also comedies. I do, I do have a lot of left to center, a lot of kind of like, you know, grown up, uh, you know, uh, types of voices in that genre. So for me, I don't think that's going away. It's just, you know, it's going to be maybe like musical chairs who gets fired somewhere and then somebody else sits in that chair. But ultimately, we're just fighting to get it paid and get the movie or TV show going or get someone staffed. So I think the problems are going to be relatively similar, but the people might be consolidated. You might instead have two people, it's one person. But either way, you're still going to have to win them over. You, you brought up two things that were kind of interesting there. One, we don't really talk about much at all, which is um, short stories and how that is being used as a way to convey ideas to potential buyers. Um, I know that uh, years ago at Bruckheimer, we bought a short story that we turned into, we developed into a screenplay, sort of an action thriller screenplay. It was a six page short story. Now, the caveat is it was written by two produced screenwriters. I'll, I'll say that up front. But it was a six page short story that set up a high concept action thriller idea. It was basically the, the, the first act of a thriller that we bought it for a million dollars. Now, again, if it was somebody who had no produced credits, that probably wouldn't have happened. But it was happening during a time when um, there were a number of such things where a lot of short stories were going out and were being used to kind of start a conversation or, or a pitch. Do you still see that happening a lot? Do you have a lot of clients that are doing that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I have uh, clients that only generate IP. Yeah. Whether or not it's a podcast or a book or comic, and that's all they do. And they have others that work across mediums. So for me, I look at what is an idea that could break through apathy, okay? Because on a regular break basis, through apathy. That's a good we go through all these yeah. routines. We, we get up, we drink our coffee, we do all these things. What could just stop you? stop you in your tracks and go, Oh my God, this, this is something that I got to just turn off my social media for a minute and just like, look at this. What is this idea? What is, where are we, what, what is going on? So it has to be undeniable. So for me, I don't care if it's the biggest author ever, because there could be somebody who self publishes their own book, but there's something about that concept that's incredible. So when I look at IP, I look at like the three P's. I look at like prestige. Is it like a New Yorker reviewed thing? You know, two is like popularity. It doesn't have a million, you know, you know, viewers. Is it like Sonic the Hedgehog, which is a very popular game? Or, and the lastly is pre-composed. Is it like the blueprints for a movie or a TV show? And ideally you have all three. That's like the most valuable one, but you might just have one of those P's and that's still going to get people's interest. Right. Okay. Um, and then you talked about uh, comedies. It seems like right now it's a desert when it comes to feature film comedy. You know, there used to be like a golden era where it felt like there were a lot of big movies like The Hangovers and 
things like that. Nowadays, and I, I don't know if this is strictly a COVID phenomenon. I, I feel like this was happening before COVID, that you're not really seeing as many straight comedies that are uh, hitting the box office. So what's your observation on that? And what do you think, um, how, how does that affect how you go out when you're, when you're pitching comedies? Yeah, I think a lot of my comedies probably are a bit weirder than we think about like the traditional, like here's my high concept comedy. They're genre bending. Um, I'm going out with one right now, which is a, is a horror comedy. And right. it's weird and fun and different. So I think that TV has gotten so sophisticated in their sensibilities when you look at comedy. Like the average comedy show is so more much more advanced than a lot of other, you know, uh, you know, comps from maybe 10 years ago. There's there's so much tonal specificity on these TV shows and unique perspectives. So with movies, I think you just have to be thoughtful that TV is so dominant in the comedy genre. Like if you think about it, when it comes to horror films, there is still genre TV, but it does, it's not as populated as comedy. So for me, I think I go for things that are a bit weirder uh, when it comes to whether or not it's film or TV. I don't think that I would go for what you think is like traditional comedy. So you, so for you, comedy uh, on a feature film level has to be more premise based than say television. You know, you can have a broad city on TV, but there's not really a concept there. Maybe there's a Shit's Creek occasionally, and that will have like a little bit of a concept, fish out of water. But for the most part, for you anyway, when it comes to comedy, you want to see a little bit more of uh, a high concept premise or a genre twist or something that shakes things up a little bit. Exactly. Or it's just really weird in its execution. Okay. Like you may not even have a big idea. It's just done in a very weird way into the the way they do it. Like it goes against expectation. So something so, like Jojo Rabbit would be an yeah, example. something like that, or um, you know, like something that something that surprises you. So like I don't think I I came from more of a genre background. Uh, when I was younger, I worked on some indie films with filmmakers. You know, most known for making horror movies. And that's kind of what I cut my teeth on before I became a manager. But as I developed as a manager, I realized that my appetite for comedies and other genres was there. Like it was some aspect of something that I wanted to, to serve myself up, like things that are going to get me excited. So I started expanding my curation to writers and directors and IP creators that are doing different things in genre. But they're all the only thing that get that gets me is their voice. There's something about their voice. You want it's like it's I can't even define it, but I would want them to say what their vision was for even another type of story. It doesn't matter. It's it's their perspective. So it, there really isn't like some pattern recognition where you'd be like, all right, these are all the people that I work with. They're only defined by sensibilities in a way that they uniquely on a style level are going to tell their story is going to get my interest. Okay. Um, and uh, so for an example, something like, I don't know if you saw Freaky, the Vince Vaughn yeah. movie, mm -hmm. would that be an example of something you might've gravitated towards? Yeah, absolutely. I thought that was a really entertaining movie. It, I think it's, it's a fun play on the genre. It, it's like, you could hear, you could, you could see it and see like what it's doing on like the like the ex how it's playing with the expectations of the genre and, and right and winking at you and almost giving you that easter egg where you're like you, you know if you really if you're in the know or you can just casually watch it and enjoy it so i think it's a it's that love letter to like you know to horror film fans out there yeah you know? I, so I feel you, like it's in the vein of things like cabin in the woods mm -hmm. or um uh scream or uh, a, a little known movie. I don't know. A lot of people have seen it. I, I actually thought the premise was fantastic. It was called The Final Girls. I don't know if you saw that. I haven't seen that one. No, but it's, I, a, it, I it, it. it's 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 Purple Rose of Cairo meets Friday the Thirteenth, or or I, Last Action Hero for a more modern audience. I it's like, like I like yeah. those films that do. I like the films that reference. I think that's always a lot of fun. Where it's almost like you're having an inside joke with the with the writer and director. Right. Yeah. No, I agree. Th those are a lot of fun. Um, I used to like those, and then I, I found I found they got overdone. It was like too it's too easy to do in a way. 
um this is like after scream you're talking about yeah yeah there was a whole there was a whole like a uh, gold rush of post scream meta you know comedy horror movies and two two diminishing returns over time but every once in a while you'll get yeah, like yeah. cabin in the woods or something that's really you know really interesting that way um and is that uh so so it sounds like you really like horror what like what what um has there been anything in the marketplace recently horror wise that you were really wowed by that's that are straight horror things that you know you were impressed i think that like i could go buy films that have really got me you know mm -hmm. um over time like i like like mungo which is like this weird australian uh uh kind of ghost film that of like that's an older movie hmm. uh, i love i love attack the block which is that yeah that's kind of great alien invasion film mm -hmm. you know for me it's almost like i just i look at movies like i like music i'll listen to jazz or i'll listen to punk rock or i'll listen to like like track music so i'm always consuming but once in a while something really gets my attention right like i love the conjuring franchise it's so operatic and exciting so like there's movies that uh, i'll watch and i'll or I'll, I'll, I'll love, but like, I think it, that's how it is. So like, I'm always consuming, but these are things that are like, like I'll represent, I'll wear a t-shirt of attack the block. I like it that much. And like, that is like, you know, my movie, like I like it. So like, I'll watch a lot of the horror movies and different things, but they kind of really just like, I'm watching things, but once in a while there's something special. It's like John Wick. Like I watch action films, but then I see John Wick. And I'm like, this is something different. Like, that's what I'm saying is you're always taking it in. But then a few times you'll be watching it. Like I like Red Rocket, that Sean Baker film. And, you know, yeah. you'll watch these indie dramas. But that one's like different. That's like a film that, you know, like it's on another level. So those are a way I look at it is that like, so, yeah, you'll see it. But those ones that really get your attention. Right. So I, I watched the Scripps and Scribes interview with you where you said your your dad had, a, had two bookstores in San Diego. Yeah. Do you think your, your taste came from just being a little kid exploring... All the crazy stuff in the bookstore so it was a combination of the bookstore which i would consume everything uh all the genre books but also like like morbid true crime stories which were probably you know <laughs> a bit early or like or anything or even stuff about like his historical you know uh fiction I, it was all across the board so it had a wide spectrum of the types of books i read concurrently <laughs> There was a uh, video store in San Diego, um, you know, in uh, Carlsbad called Red Carpet Video, and I could rent anything I wanted. Even though I was very young, I could watch John Woo films, John Carpenter, and that's also kind of sharpened my taste because I watch everything from, you know, B-movies, like, you know, fun, kind of sloppy, low-budget, you know, uh, you know, exploitation fair mixed with like, you know, Sundance films. So I would have like the high low. So my yeah. palette isn't like, oh, I only watch A24 or only, you know, for me, I watch, I'm like an omnivore. I just consume everything. You and know? your brother so, is a filmmaker. Yeah. yeah, my brother is a filmmaker and we shared sensibilities because me and him are precious with the movies we watch. We aren't going, oh, this isn't like the hip new thing. We're like, was this interesting? We'll watch that. So, that was made for like you had money. you had a friend, you had a community, even if it was just the two. Did you have more friends and you would watch horror movies together? I think I corrupted some of my friends because <laughs> I think I had a obsessive, uh, you know, you know, vision for myself as a fan. Like who what who am I? What kind of movies do I want to watch? I'd watch John Waters films. I watch everything. And I would have these friends that would be like, oh, let's go to the theater and see something. So I, I, I think I used the pipeline uh, from this video store that would get into my, um, you know, weekend list of what we watch. And we just order pizza and drink a bunch of like, you know, um, you know, Coke. And then we just sit back and watch like three movies in a night. Like, we'd watch so much. So I think I was corrupting my friends to watch things they probably not want to watch and then concurrently i think with me and my uh, older brother evan we'd be watching these things in the same pace like it wasn't like we would, you don't have to twist our arm to want to watch one of these movies we'd be excited to watch them regardless it wasn't like a thing but with my friends they may want to watch what is the popular film 
and then I would be like, Hey, I got all this VHS. Do you want to see this? And you know, like they would succumb to peer pressure and watch like a lot more wild, weird cinema. This early nineties, more or less. Um, yeah, and we watch films that were older than that, but like, you know, anything. It it could be like No, I mean the period in which this was happening. Yeah, I'm what am I, 37? So like I was like st- I started this uh addiction to film at like 13, so for a while now. Oh, so you're born, you, uh... born in 85? Mm-hmm. All right. I, uh, Lucas, did you ever work in a video store? Uh, no, but um, no, I worked at a grocery store. I'm from Martha's Vineyard. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. Uh, I... <laughs> no, we had video stores. And I remember the first one was called Sight and Sound. And all the tapes were in these uh, brown plastic cases that had the most peculiar smell. It was like sort of good, but sort of yucky. Yeah. And yeah. Only later did I realize it was because the smoke, the cigarette smoke in that place. Yeah. They, I, all smell I, like, uh... they all smell like they came from grandpa's house. <laughs> one of my one of my first jobs when I was 15, 16 years old was working at a video store in, in southern Florida. And so similar to what you're talking about, we would just watch anything and everything because we could. You know, it was just it was before the days like kids today. They don't know how good they have it with streaming and, you know, the, the anything that's on pirated sites. But back then, you know, and, and not even everything that's in the video store ultimately migrated online there's probably still a bunch of really weird things from that period that never quite made well, it there's tons of stuff that'll never be circulated again it's really yeah old. and there's that place have you been to that place in, in it's either echo uh, echo lake or silver it's echo park or silver lake where it's this vhs rental store i saw a oh piece yeah the there's um about. there's video tech in pasadena and um i just got a dvd player or a blu-ray player so i'll go there and rent some movies Wait, is um, that one in south pasadena yeah, South. Yeah, Pass. that's that's my neighborhood. Yeah, that that's that is cool there, story. you know. So, and there's a lot of movies. Um, Sally have not been distributed outside of like this one form. So there's these great directors, and you, you may have some lousy version of it on YouTube or whatever. But if you really care about the quality, you probably get to watch it uh, on a Blu-ray copy. So, yeah, and, and a lot of times it's hard uh, licensing wise. A lot of older movies that maybe had music they can't clear. This has happened. I know uh, there was a, a Bruckheimer show called Cold Case, yeah. which was you know uh, had a lot of like old songs because yeah. that affects took place a lot of television. And yeah, you couldn't you couldn't get it on anywhere because it's like it was too expensive to do that. In fact, for years that was one of the reasons why they couldn't get uh, old seasons of saturday night live the licensing from all affects, the old music i think it affects moonlighting i think it affects a lot of famous it shows definitely too. affected moonlighting yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. it, it, it affects a lot more movies than we'd expect like if you dig into it you'll see like things that you think would be obviously readily available and they're not so yeah. i'm also excited um in eagle rock um there is a uh, video store for video it's is expanding over there and it's also going to have a, a screen like a theatrical uh, experience, but you could also rent uh, movies there. Yeah. So I think that's opening up soon, which is going to be exciting. It used to be in Santa Monica, like a yeah. mile or so away from Brookheimer for many, many years. And it was like, th- that reminded me of my youth because there was stuff there I'd never seen anywhere else. You know, it was like on physical media and it wasn't always something that you could find online. You could find a lot online, but there's still some stuff that, again, never made All it right. over for whatever reason. So. I have a it's question. I have a question and a prediction. My my prediction is that regarding Star Trek, you're you know you, you're you're accepting of it and you admire it, but you're not like you didn't grow up a Trekkie. Is that right? Um, I enjoyed it. I don't think I never really connected like to anything. Uh, where I would have like this is your thing, but I always enjoyed it. Like I watched yeah. Star Trek with my family, but I've I've never like like there wasn't like a thing. Like even when I pre-covid i used to do horror movie trivia and these were like in this there's horror filmmakers and journalists and you know a few other reps and people could dig into like the minutia of this trivia and i was just there for fun i could like i i've never like been the person that's like yeah i'll, hey, I'll, tell, you, I'll the, tell you the breakdown of things so like i just enjoy it but my memory as it is is i, I forget like a lot of things so for me i would never claim to be a Trekkie, but I would enjoy Star Trek. I can explain why. Here's my theory. I get one crackpot theory at one, every episode of yeah. my show. So, and I know J.G. Abrams was like totally into horror, but he said mm-hmm. before he made Star Trek, he didn't really get Star Trek. 
So I love Star Trek because I, I'm the son of a Jewish doctor in Martha's Vineyard. In the yeah. winter, there's nothing to do. And I had no friends. I mean, I really had no friends. My brother and I were always, we always got along great. But we, and to a certain extent, like we watched Robotech together. Yeah. But when I went to high school and he was still in elementary school, like I had nobody. And Star Trek was my belonging. And you didn't need that because you had real belonging. So you could be the guy who's like, I'm going to get this gross horror movie and freak out my friends with it. And like, that was your identity to be kind of the iconoclast or to find this gnarly, weird, disturbing stuff. I needed soothing because my life was so disturbing. I needed to watch a world where everybody was friends. <laughs> yeah. I needed that. I guess we all, you know, respond to trauma in different ways, <laughs> you know, and I think that, you know, the trauma that, you know, I've experienced, I think got me more attracted to like genre, like Stephen King or Clive Barker. But at the same time, I don't think I was just so like morose. I'm like, give me your darkest stuff. Like I'm a huge fan of like John Waters. So watching his ridiculous movies, those those are not, not they're not genre but they're like their own thing they're like punk rock they have their own attitude they're very campy yeah it can't be so i i feel that like as much as i was drawn to like any horror movie that i could watch i also like things that were like you know that steve buscemi film in the miso suit for, i think that's the name of it and that was a weird movie like i like all sorts of things i like work or why so i don't think that it was like dominated by genre but i did love it you know, and I and I did get, you know, my friends to watch foreign films, too. So, like, I got them to watch a lot of different things. They they just weren't ready for the films that I was going to, like, you know, curate. They were okay with it. But you... some of them were crowd pleasers. Uh -huh. And some of them really, you know, were annoying because they're like, what am I watching? This is so, like, Oh, I'll tell you a funny weird. story. So I used to watch movies at, at Shane Black's house. Yeah. Charlie and I have a mutual friend who lived there for a while. So Shane would have movie night and they typically go watch like mainstream things or, um, uh, but one time I have a friend, Rob Burnett, who uh, is, has been involved with fandom and is very, very much an evangelist for uh, like weird arty stuff. And I invited Rob over cause it was like a mixing of worlds. And he brought that Polish horror movie with Sam Neill possession. Oh yeah. That room hated that movie. <laughs> like we turned on the lights and all, everybody, like half of everybody had just taken off. And <laughs> but because some people just aren't that way, it's a different. Um, oh, I wanted to ask: Does you do you you and your wife have the same like movie taste? Is that okay, part of there, the relationship? There's a Venn diagram yeah. where we both love. <laughs> we all uh, have that Venn diagram. Watching crime films. So <laughs> if it's like Criterion's new, uh, you know, offering, which is like. The noirs in color which is like technicolor uh you know these films we're watching that so that's kind of our happy medium that we both really enjoy those films i like movies that are insanely bad that are so bad it becomes like outsider art and she doesn't get the same pleasure for watching them she's like why would you watch this film it has like 10 percent on rotten tomatoes but for me i enjoy films where the filmmaker is almost operating in another dimension while they're making it. And then you watch it and you're like, wow, that's insane. So like, I would say that I, I have people in my life that I will share those films with, but she doesn't respond to that kind of film. But where we find a happy medium is if we're watching a cool crime film. So it's almost like she thinks it's dumb. She just is not, she doesn't, she just is why. You know, why would yeah. you watch that? Charlie, why would you, you watch why would you, why would you suffer? Why would you suffer <laughs> through a movie that the critics have like just like decimated like what is what it, what well, is we, it about that we would do that in college but i felt like i outgrew it i don't mean to be rude or anything. Oh, it's, no, it's really it, we're all talking this is this is a real issue when it comes to the venn diagram because i agree with you finding stuff that my wife and i can both agree on is a bit of a challenge you know like uh, an example of something we would both agree on would be ozark on netflix oh yeah you know? and that's that's a crime thriller Definitely. so maybe the crime thriller for whatever reason is a good one um she's not as crazy about sci-fi or horror it's really hard like if she thinks there's a science fiction component she will automatically not be interested in it i'm it's rarer that something like stranger things like we, we can watch that she's kind of okay with that but generally speaking if one of the ideas behind a movie is science fiction she won't be crazy about it horror 
sometimes she likes a horror, you know, but because again, it's like a thriller. Yeah. She'll, she'll like, she like thriller. And then comedy is really hard because, you know, I like, like you, uh, Peter, I like kind of crazy offbeat, like Idiocracy. I love Idiocracy. Oh, yeah, oh. definitely love that one. I love it. It's, it's, it. Yeah, it's a masterpiece. <laughs> and I also like, you know, some of the John Waters stuff. And um, But on, on like conventional TV, I know, Always Sunny in Philadelphia, which definitely. is definitely a crackpot offbeat show. Um, uh, Parks and Rec and Office, everybody seems to like those, you know. Um, but it's it's harder to find that kind of stuff. So like whenever I write something, my wife's like, why don't you write something about families? You know, <laughs> why don't you write like, I think she wants me to write like parenthood or something yeah. like that. And like, I, that's not where my mind generally goes with ideas. Like the closest thing I got to sort of that was I wrote a Christmas themed romantic comedy and that had some family stuff that had some sweetness and, and, and frankly it, it came out great, but it's like, that's not normally where my brain goes for, for ideas. So usually if I'll tell her an idea of mine, she's just like, ah, I don't like that. <laughs> it's just like okay well now i have to prove you wrong <laughs> and peter, peter what does your wife like that you don't is she like let's watch the godfather and you're like <laughs> no no i i like a lot of what she likes i think the fact that i have like a love of really weird outsider artists filmmakers that make to to a lot of people bad films or movies but i do enjoy these films so i wouldn't call them bad i just they're weird is that like the area where she'd be like, okay, if you want to watch that thing, just do it. But like, it's not like she she's dying to watch something like that. She does like the room, so you know, so she does like the room, like which is like the the Citizen Kane of these kind of films. But I'm like, surprised your wife likes that movie. Yeah, she it's like hard that to watch. One, but but yeah, I mean, I you know, I, I think I was a years back pre pandemic. I was I was I was always going to like some friends places and sitting on their couch and we watched nothing but those movies uh one of them was called birdemic and i think we were connected to like you know getting the screener from a distributor executive or forgot how we got it and we got it before it became like a mini phenomenon and it was like this weird movie like the birds but like just with really low res visual effects and <laughs> um yeah I, I really enjoyed it and then that kind of like became kind of a cult thing uh right. but yeah that was that was that was an activity we'd, we'd sit back and you know have a beer and watch these movies so um but yeah now you enjoy you enjoy those movies for yourself for consumption but like when it comes time to try to make money by hustling your client scripts would you say that you you wouldn't want all your clients to be writing movies in that in that genre of cult movie because it would be too hard for you to earn a living <laughs> trying to like well set up I don't those movies. I don't think you could attempt to write it I think it takes uh, a certain kind of mindset yeah that is operating differently than the traditional filmmaker like the director Neil Breen like his work is I think he's a Vegas uh, I think a real stage and he make, he self finances his kind of like you know his his thrillers and his his movies and and his movies are just his thing you can't you can't replicate that thing that that is a whole other vibration so like for writers they're only going to write with their own voice you can't like imitate that voice because it's theirs you know like whatever well, I mean, maybe is, maybe, I, be, maybe i framed it, the question wrong there's no way really. they could do that it's like I don't know. I mean, in any genre of art, there's like a musician who does really weird music. You're not, you can't just copy that, you know? I think, I, I, I think regarding like the people that I sign, they can only do what they do. They can't like make this weird, bad outsider. But you're not going to take out a script that you know is going to be 10% fresh. No, no way. <laughs> because, because like, and also I wouldn't sign somebody, their first draft wouldn't be a 10% fresh, you know, like, like they, they're like commercial enough, even if they're like, you know, more, you know, on the arty side, their sensibilities are more aligned with the market. So these people that I think make these really unusual movies, they're in their own, they're on their own world. That's not, you can't replicate it. I mean, they're the, you know, you could try to make a campy bad movie, um, but it's never going to be as fun as the outsider director who does their vision of like a Hitchcock film, well, but it's totally insane. Like, I don't think, I think it's so much more pure uh, and authentic if they're generating it on their own. They're not trying to like do something 
that but, but, but those people you would you wouldn't be looking to sign Tommy Wiseau, for example. That would I don't, I don't think like I don't think he needs a, a rep. I think he's his own business. I mean, he's actually pretty successful. He he owns the rights to his own movie. Yeah. Which is, you know, different than most filmmakers who lose the rights. He has the merch, he tours his film, and his film's been profitable for many years. So as a you know, as a business, he's kind of like different than even a traditional filmmaker, is he's very entrepreneurial. Most filmmakers make the film sell the movie and then they're they're off to the new movie very rarely they can consistently monetize the same project over over time so i think he's actually his own category there isn't a lot of uh you know producers and directors that operate in the same system that he does where he's not reliant on all these intermediaries that take a percentage of his cut so he's his own thing yeah let me say Go ahead. Go ahead look so it. I made an unloved cult film called Lucky Bastard. Had you ever heard of it? I haven't heard of that one. Oh, it's an NC-17 found footage movie about murders on a porn set. Yeah. We had a hard time getting distribution. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I I think like, I think the things are like a time was so, these are like, they're kind of like a, one thing that you could critique these types of um, filmmakers, but the amount of times people have actually watched these movies, like Troll 2, uh, which they actually made a documentary about, they have like a great rewatchable quality. There's something weird about a movie that's just totally terrible and ridiculous and crazy that you could watch over and over again that you may not be able to watch with like a movie that's like highly ranked by the critics because there's something kind of like, it's like a party movie. You know, you could joke around, you can have fun. It's not like, you miss a beat and you're like, what did I, you know, what, what did I, uh, what did I see? Like, is there a plot point that just escaped me and I don't know what the hell's happening? But these other movies were just wild stuff just keeps happening. You can just sit back and enjoy it. So do you like mystery science theater or is oh, that? Oh yeah, I grew up on that. That was fun. Yeah, yeah I, 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 that was a point in television for me. That was a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed it. So yeah, I like to, what I would just say in perspective is I like all sorts of movies. Is there I, like, don't I like, like the prestige ones. I like the ones that are like more pure, just like entertainment. I love Bad Boys. It's like I've had so much fun. Like I love the franchise. So like hats off to you. Like I'm, I just like to keep keep my mind open and not be like overly like narrow in my view of what I'm going to watch. So there's just a wide spectrum of what I could like quote and I could just kind of reference. And I think that it helps your vocabulary when you want to talk about story. If you all you watch is one kind of movie, then you're limited, you have blind spots. But if you're able to watch a full mix of you know films, I think it puts you in a way better position to just collaborate with people. Well, I also think if you're a writer, you, you bring up a very good point, which is everything that you come up with, your imagination is a remix of all the inputs that you've ever had right yeah. whatever they are music movies tv comic books anything your brain comes up with ways to to reconnect uh all of this material that's bouncing around in your brain and the version of that that comes out when you write that is um that's your voice that's your style that's the thing that is so interesting right so uh, stephen king when he was writing when he was young you know he read all the richard matheson stuff he watched all the 1950s b-movie horror stuff and he remixed those into books in the 70s that were his version of all those things. And his voice was really uh, cool and, and edgy and, and, and gripping. So um, I, I agree, you should watch, even if you don't like them, you know, watch foreign films, Westerns, you know, Bollywood, just anything just to sample these things. And because um, if you really are, you know, using your imagination for a living, you want to feed your imagination. You want to feed it whatever you can you, you can put in there. And, um, you know, my, my greatest moments, I'm sure Lucas is too, are these eureka moments where your brain is like bouncing around two completely disconnected ideas and fuses them. And that's how you come up with like, wait a minute, I can't, am I the first person to come up with that? And then you go and Google, you're looking at anybody working on this idea anywhere and you feel this rush of excitement because you suddenly came up with that big high concept idea. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's a great way to operate. I agree with that, Peter. And it's also a competitive advantage. So 
if your goal is to win in the marketplace, it's better to have a much deeper knowledge of the genres that you work in. So if they're just operating, if another writer is operating on the surface and you're going, I go deeper in this, I know about this Turkish film or I know about this cult film from the 70s. Like you just have a more words to use to, to tell your story in a way because I feel every movie in some ways expands that vocabulary. So I think that if you could just sample things that are interesting, I mean, in some ways, if you think about a DJ producing music and creating remixes and things, the deeper the references that they could use, they could construct an entirely new piece, it's right. going to be way more impactful if it doesn't just sound like everything else. So I do feel that if you're like, I, I want to write Westerns, like, do you know about the, you know, the primary colors, the main Westerns, the ones that everyone knows? But do you know about the weirder Westerns? And I think sometimes there's this purity test. The film, film just needs 100% of Rotten Tomatoes for you to watch it. But then I feel that you missed opportunities to watch a film that had a weird thesis that didn't land. But it did really interesting things. Like, sure. I think if you think about Tarantino, Tarantino is really examining the characteristics of the movies. He's not just chasing whatever is popular. So I think that as, you know, writer or director, or whatever you do, it's important to like become obsessive because that's how you're going to be able to really construct something that cuts through all the noise that's out there. Well, oh, well, Tarantino is a really good example of that. And again, he worked at a video store. So another guy who fed his brain with all sorts of crazy things and he borrows from obscure sources like uh, you know everything is obviously borrowed from something else it's how you remix it but if you don't want people to call you a ripoff artist generally speaking the more obscure the source that you can go back to and those elements the better off you are in a lot of ways because you know if you're a true tarantino level cineast right you can watch his movies and go oh he's the city on fire or whatever he's you know taking from but it's like what less than one tenth of one percent of people know City on Fire, so it's yeah. like to them that's new. To them that's interesting. So uh, those are the better sources. I, I've had a different experience. Um, I because I did grow up with sort of as an omnivore and watching everything and and priding myself and in, in watching obscure things. I was publishing Film Score Monthly, so I got exposed to all kinds of different movies to watch uh, to check out the scores. I got myself in trouble as a writer when I when I was trying to reference when I was trying to remix, when I was becoming too conscious of how did this movie uh, take this plot point. And it was only um, it was only really when I just started throwing that stuff out and starting to think from more real life experience, things that I had felt as a husband, as a father, as uh, you know, somebody whose parents are getting older, as I was stopping to think, let's not pretend this is a movie, let's pretend this is a real guy. That's when things I felt opened up to me. And I'd say, no, 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 we don't need the chase here. This is the moment for the guy to go back in his room and cry. And it's just because it, and that freed me because otherwise I was driving myself crazy, just going sideways into different things I had already seen. Yeah, I think that's part of you finding your own voice, right? It's, it's you kind of like moving in a direction that feels more authentic for you in terms of character, in terms of emotion, and how those beats play out in a story or a well, plot? I sure as hell hope so. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's, I think that's, that's definitely true. Do you, uh, Peter? Do you feel like you know uh, you're, you're referencing people like John Waters or Ed Wood or Tommy Wiseau? Like, are, are there new people that are not on everybody's radar that you're paying attention to, who are these sort of like new outsider artists who have a little bit of a body of film behind them now that are worth people checking out just for, for fun? <laughs> Yeah, I don't have anybody. I have like the the ones that I kind of like were introduced. Um, and I used to have like, you know, pre-COVID again, like I used to have like these hangs where, you know, you'd watch these really unusual movies. So I don't have any references to like uh, those people. Um, I haven't watched a good amount of them for a while now, but whenever there's a movie uh, that's out that people talk about, you know, I'll, I'll know about it because I know the people who find them, you know, interesting, but yeah, I haven't, there isn't anyone that comes to mind at the moment. Well, here's, here's a good question. I know that uh, many of the people who watch our show are aspiring writers. And, and this is a question I think is always useful for managers, right? 
where do you get your material? When, you, when you're looking for, maybe you're not always actively looking for clients, but if somebody lands on your radar, who's a potential client, where did that script come from? Who, who recommended it to you and why do you listen to them? Okay, so what happens is I typically get an email where someone sends me an email and says, hey, do you want to check out my friend's script? And that could be like an executive, um, that could be, you know, anybody that, you know, has someone in their world that is looking for uh, representation. So I got called yesterday by a buddy of mine who's a producer who just said, hey, I have a writer. Let me send some log lines over. So typically it's through a recommendation. Okay. And these are people who are in your network whose taste you trust, people that you just have known for years and you trust they're not going to send you crap. Well, I mean, they could send me something that's well-written. It just may not be my taste, you know, right. and that's a very specific thing mm -hmm. uh, because any you know manager has to work very hard pushing a client. So it has to be something that you uh, fall in love with. So I know that the people are sending me legitimate candidates, you know, people that probably will be successful at some point, but they may not be the the type of work you're interested in. So you just have to like take a look at it, but you at least know it's at to a, to a standard uh, professionally uh, with what they could do as a, a writer or director. But then the next question for yourself is, is this somebody that you, you want to go out and fight for? I was going to say, that's got to be a big choice for you. When you get a piece of material, there's two questions. One is, do I love this material or writing? And then the other one is, can I earn a living? <laughs> if I take this client on, it, we're going to be able to get him writer, you know, rewrite work, or we're going to be able to set up his original ideas. Am I, am I going to be able to monetize this writing? Because like you just said, you might read something that you love, but you're like, yeah, but I can't. I know, I know how hard it's going to be to sell this right now. And I just don't have the time or the bandwidth to do that with this writer right now. I have to find a writer who I love, I love the writing and I also see a path forward in terms of making money from them. Yeah. And then there's the, the third question is how do they present themselves? You know, when you meet them, do you feel that you could put them in a room and mm -hmm. they could go for the kill and get the assignment? Because this whole business is competition for everything. Yeah every part of this business you're fighting to just push your agenda forward you know each each day it's like you're just clawing to get to that thing to happen and if you get the person that opportunity do they have the uh emotional iq is it high enough for them to read the room listen take notes be collaborative be versatile because just because someone's a good writer doesn't mean they're the right person for an opportunity yeah yeah, always be closing. A, B, C. You, you got to make sure when you're in the room, you can close. Yeah. Do you, would you do you have like a one liner for what your taste is? I think I have a sense, but I don't know how you would describe it. In regards to the type of person I want to work with, or the material. To their, the material. Yeah. I think that like the work that I tend to be interested in is either genre or if it's you know comedies or dramas they typically are more subversive or darker. Interesting. Is that harder to sell? I mean, there's more people like me out there who want to watch it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's going to be people want to, you know, distribute it for our consumption. Um, I don't, I don't think it's impossible. I think there's a lot of things that I don't respond to, which are very popular. I don't, respond to things that are typically if it's like a, a feel-good kind of drama I'd probably not get to respond to it but they're sure another manager would I like things like Barry I like watching that show that's do you like jam. uh did you like Promising Young Woman yeah I like that too so like I, I have certain sensibilities that relate to what I watch like if you you, you could ask any rep you know, what are they watching? That probably influences who they're working with. No, that's a good, that's a good rule of thumb. That makes sense. Do you know uh, any reps that have watched Chinatown a hundred times like me? I haven't had that conversation uh, about the frequency of watching Chinatown, but 
I'm sure there, I, there I could, have been anybody I, who's I a could manager, watch it every day. <laughs> anyone who's a manager or an agent, you know, I'm, sh- I'm sure they they're just as much as cinephiles as you are. So because you know that you're you're why are you selling this, you know this you know kind of project versus selling something else. You you know I think people tend to care about it. It's like why is somebody a chef or you know why is somebody this? It's like they fell in love with emotion or nostalgia connected to an experience and they live in that you know they access it through their work right right i saw on twitter last night that you said you were wanted to start a a podcast or a show like this and i think that's great i would i would watch it um but it made me think about why i've wanted to do one myself and a lot of it was because uh, I guess I still carry as an adult a feeling of not having the community I, I want to have. And it's so hard to write and it's so hard to advance yourself that when you figure out something cool, at least for me, it's like, oh, I want to share it. I want people to go, guys, don't do that. It's a waste of time. Here's the trick. Here's the easier way. I mean, is, do you have that feeling to help people and connect with people or sound? or? I think it's exciting to share ideas. And I have a subjective view of reality. So there could be other reps that could have another way in. So I, by no means what I'm presenting is a truth. It's only my truth. So what I like to do in the past was organize panels. I had panels in virtual reality, augmented reality, podcasting, um, screenwriting. I had them at the Soho House in West Hollywood the last bookstore in downtown LA. So I've had these experiences where out in the, you know, where people could sit down and share ideas and they could talk, you know? And then as a independent thinker, anyone in there could either argue with ideas and not like them, like some of them and kind of pull in their own reality that they extract the value of these conversations. So I've actually done these panels in the past um, and I really enjoyed them. I moderated them. And before that, I used to have actually a podcast called Hollywood 2.0, which we talked about the cross section of media and technology before Silicon Valley, like fully consumed our business and was talking about this patterns of these things moving in this direction. And we had a woman from Sundance who was in her innovation uh, side of the business, bringing in all sorts of different types of storytellers. So that was something that really got me interested. Now for a while, I didn't podcast at all. I just stopped. I was just doing my work, you know, as a manager and a producer and do my thing. But at a certain point, I got that itch again. And I was like, spend all this time on Twitter, right? And you're tweeting and doing stuff. What is Twitter? It's about connecting. It goes back to community. How do we connect? And us speaking together is building community and connection. So for me, I'm like, might as well start doing podcasts again because I enjoy it. And it's a way that you could find like-minded individuals or share your passion. It's like finding a, like you're at a party and you don't know who to talk to at this party and say your interests are screenwriting. If you talk to the person over here, do they even care about what you care about? They might care about race cars. And you're like, all right, this was boring. Got to get to try to move around the party to get to someone you want to talk to. The great thing about podcasting is you somehow consolidate everybody who's interested in your conversation. So I want to do this Q and a podcast for me as a manager, talking about my own personal experiences, but also I have another podcast where I talk to people who create IP for the entertainment industry. So it could be someone, a comic publisher, who's also a film producer, you know, who takes their comics and then sells them. So I'm talking to those individuals. So these are two things that if I was at a party, I would have to try to find someone who might know, what I'm talking about and might care here. I'm almost creating a party every time I'm doing one of these things that hopefully is entertaining. Okay. And hopefully it's informative, but that's the driver is that, you know, you you want to find an opportunity to geek out on the things that are interesting. You're creating screenwriting salons, as they say. That's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I mean, that's what makes it fun. I mean, also now, yeah. I mean, because of COVID it's tricky to just like, pull people together because you don't know if somebody got COVID and then suddenly they can't engage. So doing it digitally for the time being, and just allows a cool platform for conversation. Oh, and I, I, I think I that's agree. what matters. I agree. I agree with all your, what you're saying and your philosophy. 
And I also agreed with most, almost all of what I heard in the other interview with you, I saw, and it reminded me uh, when my friend and I interviewed Nick Meyer about Star Trek II for the liner notes, yeah. he referred to his house, and uh, he was very gracious to have us, and he was talking about his philosophies of movie making, and and I, I was just so enraptured, and I said, we, we feel the same way as you, and you know what he said? I am relieved beyond words. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and I told him that a year a, a year later, and he goes, "Oh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, pull a harpoon on myself." Anyway, <laughs> we'll have Nick on. I'll ask Nick. He'll promote. He'll 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 be on. I'm a big fan of Nick's. Yeah. So uh, it's been around an hour. You got any? Uh, um, I ran out of questions, but uh, <laughs> sometimes these things, um, you know, sort of take on a life of their own. Uh, Charlie, do you have anything? No, I think it's I think it's great. It makes me want to go back and watch some of these cult movies that I probably haven't watched in a little while, and uh, you know, uh, fill in some of my uh, John Waters back catalog. There's there's a couple of movies I have not seen of John Waters, and um, uh, big big fan. Of, Lucas and I talk about this. Uh, I I love the subgenre of movies that's about outsider film directors, whether it's oh. Bowfinger or Ed Wood or. Dolomite is my name or the disaster artist. Like to me, I don't know why I respond so much to that. And I think it's similar to what you're saying, Peter, which is like these people just have passion and they have a dream and they're not going to take no for an answer and they're going to find a way to make their movie. And maybe there'll be one movie that they make and they'll, they'll put it together. And, you know, sometimes that movie never gets distributed beyond their family and friends in this small town in Texas. And sometimes it becomes the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Have, I, have you I seen the good. Living in Oblivion? I think that was I said I, in the Muse So Stoop. I was wrong. It's a it's a Steve Buscemi film. It's all black white. I think it's Living in Oblivion where he's trying to make an indie movie. Oh no, I have not. Mm -mm. I I just no. want to double check. So yeah, that's a, a um that might fit into the subgenre. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Living in a, it's such a fun weird uh, movie. It's a kind of Living in Oblivion. Um, it might be that one. Yeah, it's living. I think it's a living in oblivion. Um, I think that's that might be the and the and one. Steve Buscemi wrote it, directed it, and starred in it. I'm not sure um his capacity in it. Um, uh, but 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 his Tom DeCilio directed it. Um, but it's a independent film director Nick Reeve. Steve Buscemi is making his first feature. So yeah, oh, it's, okay. a, it's one of those right, fun gotcha. little. No, that sounds anyways. fun. All right, I'll have to check that out. For How sure. many of your? I have a new question. How many of your clients are? only writers as opposed to like hyphenates they also direct or, or produce i think it's a mix it's hard to really engage on that mm -hmm. question completely is because there some of them are building their projects to direct so there's like a mix of individuals that have ambitions to to direct a feature so for me i'm completely supportive of somebody who's a writer director um, because i know how you know it's you get inspired, you write all this work and you're like, I actually want to control it. You know, so I, I, I'm totally supportive if somebody wants to step into the, the director chair. I actually have a question. Oh, I actually go, have a question. Go ahead, Charlie. Um, uh, and we've talked about this in, uh, in previous uh, episodes a little bit. Um, when it comes to the clients that you do decide to sign, right? Um, we know that there are some managers out there who want to sort of test audition log lines before they kind of approve a writer to launch and write a new idea as opposed to the writer writing whatever they want bringing it to you and it's like oh jojo rabbit i have to go sell jojo rabbit now as opposed to well what are you thinking of working on next jack uh, and jack talks to you about the projects and you try to find the idea that you think is the most marketable and sellable and one of the things he's working on like is there a way that you work with your clients to figure out what they should write or do you just go write whatever you love i'll go out and i'll try to sell it that's my job i think each relationship to a client is its own business and has uh characteristics that are unique to the individual so there's no one way to work with them because they have the, they demand different types of collaboration mm -hmm. so for me i just have to kind of get a, a feel for what is the best way for us to be successful together is, it, is there a way that you prefer would you prefer to do the version where it's like you figure out what to write before they write it or are you surprised me i mean i think it's just their unique needs 
of uh, the client. So I have some clients that we're more intensely working through log lines. I have others that kind of kind of find their vision through theme or a tone they're exploring. So case by case. Yeah, absolutely. Makes Did sense. you ever want to be a filmmaker? Yeah, actually, um, I think initially I saw myself as a writer and I realized I didn't like writing that much. And <laughs> What? I uh, what also saw myself like? as a director and didn't like directing. Why didn't you like them? I think that I like the multitasking on a macro level and that's my brain is more global. So I like operating of all these projects and uh, getting into the mix of different things keeps me excited. Um, it helps me uh, really utilize you know, my thought process in a way that I am more used to rolling through selling and making calls and engaging a lot of different things than like, you know, being a writer director where you're really defining and designing this thing and shipping away at it. And this kind of working on that, like that real focus uh, is something that doesn't really lend itself to what gets me passionate. What I feel most excited about is looking at a portfolio of collaborators and projects and be able to navigate the relationships I have and be able to figure out what is the best way to get things moving forward. So that actually is what I grew to realizing that worked best for me versus, you know, living in a movie for two years. So you, so you, so your sensibilities, your, your temperament and your skill set is moving across a spectrum of projects rather than spending two years on one thing and one thing alone. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That makes sense. I've heard a lot of managers don't like handling writer directors because it takes so long to monetize them. If they're a first time director making a movie for half a million dollars and their fee might be 40 grand, I mean, you're gonna be helping that writer for two years <laughs> and you're gonna make four grand. So a lot of them just won't even uh, discuss it. I guess you're, you know, you have a good portfolio of clients and uh, seeing the long game. I mean, I think that there is a uh, a halo around uh, businesses uh, or people online. There's this idea where if you get through this experience that they have, whether or not it's their publicity or their content or what they make or who they associate with. So if your job is to be in the entertainment industry and present yourself uh, as a, someone to be taken seriously and all you're looking for is those easy, you know, wins, but you're not building long-term value, ultimately people might just not care about you. But if you launch a hundred thousand dollar movie, you just make enough money you could go to Sizzler with. But that hundred thousand dollar movie is so cool. Who knows what those opportunities open up around you? Because now you're associated with something that's interesting. I think you have to present yourself as a brand. And what is makes your brand more meaningful is the what you're what's around you. So if someone watches this movie, they go, oh, that's really interesting. Or somebody even listens to a podcast from one of your clients and it's with like, you know, real actors that, that they, they have relationships with, they get it, they understand. So the more you have these things going around you, the better you're going to be. And I think that, especially when you're a boutique like me, you're not like this big corporate entity. So it is important that you don't just go, oh my God, I got a one little, you got this assignment for a writer. Cool. That's important. But if they could direct a movie that plays slam dance and it gets people's attention, it gets press. I think that's important too. I think you have to balance the short term and the long term wins to be successful. If you're just focused on the long term, there's no income, right? You're not getting building a business. If you're just focused on the short term, you're just getting these little wins, but you're not building to something bigger. So you're saying that in Hollywood, people actually only focus on short-term wins and it's not good? I never said it's not good. I can only speak to <laughs> I how have just, I operate. I, know, I can't I'm, speak I'm, to I'm, what is good or bad. I'm being a little silly. I mean, I have, I have met so many people who 
they've said one thing in interviews, and I believe that you're saying the truth for you, but there are people who talk a good game in interviews and then off the record, they're like, I can't sell that. I can't make money off you. And they're just, they're just, they're just gone. They're just looking for money. It's just completely transparent. We've talked about this uh, in previous shows. Um, I've had a number of managers and a number of agencies uh, represent me over the 30 plus years I've been in the business, pretty much every major agency. And the bottom line is you kind of have to do your own work. You have to dig your own hole. You have to go out there and network, make those connections. Anybody who thinks that I'm going to get signed by CAA and like suddenly, you know, everything's going to happen for me and I can just lean back and not have to do any work. It's just, it's just simply not true. You know, you, you still have to be going out there, meeting people, uh, doing all the networking, uh, making connections, because ultimately, at least what I've found and from most of the writers that I talk to, like those relationships and those connections are where those jobs are going to come from. It's nice to have representation, obviously, but you also need to be active. You, you can't just be passive and assume you, Peter, are going to do all the work for that client. You know, you, I'm, I'm assuming you want clients who are active, who are going out there, who are trying to make things happen because, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, a body in motion tends to stay in motion. You don't want to just find some schlub who wrote one good screenplay and goes, okay, get me work. That's, that's not how it works, right? Well, I'll tell you like this, and I totally agree. I look at it like my collaborators, we're wolves and we're on the hunt. And maybe on this pack of wolves, there's an agent. Maybe there's a lawyer, you know, regardless of my client, we're trying to push our agenda forward and we got to hunt together to take down a kill. Okay. Yeah. It's so not a lone wolf running through the forest, you know, no, it's a pack. And we all have to communicate, be on the same page. And if we could find that cohesion together as a collective, we're way more effective at winning. You know, I have a project right now that I'm working with an agent, a producer, and my client. And me and her, and we're all communicating. We're all we're on step, and we're moving in on the kill. And that's how you do it. Now, if everybody is doing a different thing, everyone's siloed to just bad communication, good luck. We're probably going to fail. It's too tough of a business. But I do believe that it's a you have to look at it as a community together to figure it out because you might have one person who has Intel, another person who has a relationship. The client has now become friends with someone connected to the person we want to like bring onto the project. It's a community victory. It's not just a manager or just an agent or a lawyer or just your client. It's us together trying to figure things out. Um, And Uh, I think that's the best way to be successful or, you know, it's not going to work. Can I, can I ask you a broad question uh, of the work that you find yourself getting for clients? How does it break down percentage-wise TV versus film? Is it mostly film or mostly television these days? I think it's a mix. And I do think it's like, I think there's these conversations that come from headlines where it's like, it's just TV or movies are making a comeback. But I do feel that there's opportunities in both spaces and also in podcasts too. Like the the audio drama world is starting to develop and become something. Is there, is the, is anybody getting paid in the drama podcast world or is that still very nascent in terms of how people are monetizing that? Well, that goes back to the, the short term to long term wins short term. You make a bit of, you know, a little money here or there, but the long term is if it gets sold as a TV show and right. gets, you know, greenlit and you have a series that you just created initially as a proof of concept with a in the audio right. drama then it's a big win so i think it just depends on how you look at it so podcasts are similar to short stories comic books it's just another place where you could potentially generate ip that could then get set up as a pitch or as a project around town um, yeah and podcasts are a business you know yeah. there are companies that spotify has purchased for 50 to 200 million dollars Right. Or just hey, Charlie, we just got to do some more episodes. Well, we don't have a podcast yet. This is a YouTube show. We still All have right. to figure out the audio only component I'll, of this. I'll figure it out. Here. We'll figure it out. So, yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of opportunities to get different types of wins, you know, but mm-hmm. you want to keep building all the different ways to tell your story and connect to people. 
Yeah. And it's not one size fits all. And if you look at companies like Q Code, which is from uh, Rob Herding, who was at CAA, who created his own audio drama company, he set up a lot of shows based on you know his podcast. Uh, he's successful at it. So it's a, uh, there's opportunities out there, but I think the key is looking at it, not just on that one deal, but also looking at how's my brand as a, as a creator going to look like, is there, what could I do to put out material, whether or not it is short stories or is web comics or whatever it is that you mix it up or you create, you know, content, you know, they put out on Twitter. I think that we also want to make sure that we're never reliant on especially on the early level relying on this one yes or no or whatever it's like how can you be generative like one of my old interns is going out and creating a a web series right now with no money but he's just making it yeah and it may not be a, a quick win but it may get him staffed in a year or two and who knows you know so no, i think it's about yeah. like shaking up the the molecules you know creating those vibrations where you're doing things you're engaged and you're not just, you know, go, man, I want to wait on that one rep or that, you know, it, it because that's just not going to work. You have to be yeah. aggressive and really push your, your vision and really build your community. Yeah. My, my daughter, my daughter is a, at Emerson and she's a communication student. And a lot of her friends are in the comedy arts program at Emerson. They have a, they have a, a program dedicated specifically to comedy. And I always ask her, you know, what are your friends doing over the summer? The friends that are in the comedy arts program. And I very rarely hear that they're working on short films or web material or like, you know, coming up with their own stuff. But the ones that are will be the ones that make it. Because, you know, if you're just only doing it for school and then it comes summer and you're working at a pizza place and getting high, that's awesome. But you're not going to be Trey Parker and Matt Stone. Trey Parker and Matt Stone were making those like, you know, cardboard animation things for their own laughs, for fun. And they were like building, you know, their skills and they were creating a portfolio without even knowing it because they just loved doing that. So that's that um, initiative, that drive is something that I don't even know if you can teach that. That might be something that might just be innate, something that you either have to have or don't have. Like certain people could be great writers. But as, if you, as you said, if they don't like writing, it doesn't matter. They're not going to write. They might be terrific. But like you can't be bugging them all the time to say, How's the book coming along? How's the chapter coming along? Did you write that scene for the screen? That's, it's never going to happen. It's the person who just, in my spare time, this is what I wanted to do. It's not always easy, but it's like, I have these ideas. I want to get them out of my head, whether it's in a short story, whether it's in a comedy sketch, whether it's in a feature film or a TV pilot, or you said a podcast or a comic book, whatever it is, I want to get the ideas out of my head. I want to share them with people. I want other people to see these ideas. You, you have to have that drive. It has to be there. Otherwise, you're really not going to be able to make a living at it. There are very few people that don't fit that temperament who make it in this business, I think. Absolutely. And you also need to do community building and not just look at this, oh, my God, I got to hang out with that one person who's more advanced. There's also like sideways networking, people who are like, oh, my God, you're a director, you did a short film. I wrote a script. Maybe mm -hmm. we should team up. It's building this group of individuals who really care. And it may not mean that any of them are that successful right now, right. but bring them, build like a movie night, invite people to a movie night, have this community that you kind of nurture. Like those things add value where people are like, oh my God, you put together the horror trivia. You should invite this journalist or invite this yeah. you know, assistant who's at this company. Even if it's not the most established people around, like, just pulling together that community, you could yeah. suddenly start extracting value. Oh, that assistant at the company, they could push the script. Oh my God, the director who's done short films, maybe you yeah. could direct the feature. And then we know there's one guy there who knows someone who has money. And then you start pulling together all these different parts. But if it's kind of like, if they're all disparate, you can't right. leverage the network. But if you bring them together, who knows how these different parts connect that build future projects but it's all generated from an activated community yeah the, the alchemy of creating a network is one thing professionally as you're saying obviously that helps expand your influence and your ability to sort of leverage your ideas it's also just helpful to have them 
for moral support. <laughs> you know, like it, writing is lonely. Creating stuff can be lonely. Like, you know, you want to be able to like have feedback from like-minded individuals and hear thoughts and ideas that might spark something in your brain and, and other people who just have your back when you're like struggling through coming up with ideas. Um, I, you know, when I first came to California in the late eighties, early nineties, that, that's what I did with my friends. You know, we had a bunch of friends who all wanted to screenwrite and there were probably seven or eight of us that would fluctuate on a weekly level that would come to somebody's house and we would all talk about new ideas we had ideas that we were working on you know we would cross collaborate that kind of thing and you know out of one of those ideas which was frankly a silly throwaway idea came um the first real screenplay that I ever got an agent and made money from was just like, you know, a, a dopey joke that we tried to make ourselves laugh with in this meeting that we said, that's not a half bad idea. And then we worked on that idea. We wrote the whole screenplay out. And it, as you said, through friends of friends, we met people who knew agents or agents assistants. And that's how we got the agent. But but that first domino came from that sort of group networking, creating your sort of support group of writers and filmmakers who wanted to do stuff. They're not all gonna make it, but some of them will. And um, it's only helpful. And that's the kind of personality and you're looking scene. for in a, in a client. I was, I was gonna ask what, what kind of personality yeah. do you look for in a client? But I think it's all been implied by your answers. Yeah. I mean, the, to be honest, I was bringing up um, a type of tactic that would be beneficial for a person who wants to build their career uh you know as a writer or director but i don't feel that the clients that i rep have to want to do any of these things they might just want to write specs that's fine too so i don't feel that i don't feel there's one way to operate in this business you know i'm a manager who does podcasts and creates content there's plenty of successful managers who don't everyone has their unique personality and identity i think when regards to the personality of a client i want to work with it's somebody that i feel that i could win with like i feel that even if it's someone who's not going to do all this networking but we could talk we could be on the yeah. same page that they're not like me because i don't do what they do and you know they, but at the same time we respect each other and we respect our process. And that's what I go by. So I don't think there's like a winning attitude or, you know, or somebody, you know, holds himself in a certain way. I just want to be able to that we could talk to each other and be open and have a really honest relationship. So talent, a voice and somebody that you get along with. Yeah. That we could talk. All right. All right. There you go. Well, that's a good thing to go out on. Um, and you have a new baby. Yeah. The, the hey, baby. congratulations. That's awesome. awesome. Great. How, how yeah. Fantastic. About four months. Aww. Sleeping through the night? Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it'll get I, I remember sleep deprivation. Yeah, I, we, had, we had two of those at the same time. That oh was a lot. Wow. Yeah. It, but it, it, um, when they got to a certain point, they started to play with each other, and now it's easier. But that's where that first year was rough, but it's a wonderful experience. I, I mentioned that because I saw some pictures on, I can't remember where, but you looked very happy as a, as a proud daddy and I'm very happy for you. I appreciate that. Okay. Well, and, and, and thank you, uh, Peter, for, for taking time out to, to do this with us and sharing your stories and your wisdom. I'm sure our, our viewers uh, will get a lot out of it and uh, best of luck to you and uh, all your future projects. Thank you. And uh, I appreciate you having me on your show. I had a fun time and it was great uh, rapping with you guys. Okay. Terrific. Well, thanks so much, Peter Katz. Thank you, Charlie. And I'm Lucas Kendall. And we'll see you folks next week. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jane.